Okay, we're back and we're plowing our way through Murak's MySQL book. And we're up to chapter 15 now. Earlier, we created some stored procedures and we executed them. There are bits of code that do things. And now we're going to expand on that. There's a lot of there's a lot of work in this chapter. We'll see how fast we can get through it. Again, I don't want you to I want you to learn it. I want you to understand it basically, but the goal of this class is to not really turn you into SQL developers. So um, give it your best shot and um, you'll learn a lot. The big difference here is we're gonna focus on um, we're going to focus on the difference between a procedure and a function. Think about it, it that a block of code could have input and a block of code could have output. and um, Or maybe it just does some work. So far, the procedures we've done just did some work. We didn't enter in any data into the procedure, and it didn't return anything. It was just a procedure that did whatever was said inside the code. Now the first example we're going to do is create a procedure, but we're going to be able to pass in a couple of parameters, a couple of variables of information, and then it will do the work. Then later on we'll move on where we pass in some information, but then it will actually return a result, and that will actually use in select statements that we create. Okay, we're on page 416 and 417, and we're going to create a procedure. And it's a little, for if you're pulling it from the supplied examples. It's a little strange the way this is printed out here. It's neater, especially as these things get bigger, but notice this parenthesis, starting parentheses and closing parentheses. Think about it this way. And again, this is <coughs> this different ways to display code and normally you might not do it all of this way, but I want to kind of show the point <coughs> of what we're doing here. So here, we're going to drop the procedure update invoices credit total. And we're going to create a procedure called update invoices credit total. And this parentheses here, the outer parentheses, is kind of the doorway into the program. And we're going to pass in an integer called invoice ID and a credit total. And then we're going to begin the procedure. Uh, we've got transaction information happening. We've got an error handling happening. And we're going to update the credit total for the record. So we have an invoice ID and <coughs> excuse me, a credit amount that we actually want to to pass in so we can update the credit total for any any invoice we want so let's go ahead and execute this whole thing okay the procedure has been created we come over to our routines and we and refresh them update invoices total has been created nothing ran nothing happened but let's take a look at an existing invoice Select invoice ID and the credit total from invoices where invoice ID equals 56. You can see here that the credit total for this invoice is set to zero. Now, without rebuilding it, let's just call the procedure we, we made call update invoices passing in the number 56 which is the invoice ID and the value 200. I'm going to just click on that or I could highlight it, execute it, it ran it and now let's run our select statement and now you can see the invoice total is 200. Let's change the invoice total to 279 and this is actually a decimal, so 0.35. Okay, we're running, passing in a new parameter. We're going to do a select. 
and we see that the, that's changed. We also have available to us the drop command that we can drop up the procedure if it exists. And that name happens to be test, but we could have dropped this procedure if we needed to. I'd say don't drop it, let's keep it in our hip pocket just in case we want to refer to it later. On page 418 and 419, we now are introduced to output variables. Notice here in this procedure, and I've renamed this one instead of just update invoice credit total, I've added the number 2 to it, added the number 2 to it, and then the execution added to the number 2. Now, if we take this, highlight this, and execute that, um, oh, the procedure already exists, so it, it's not creating it. I already created it. So execute that. And now if we come here and just actually call it, the inputs of 56 and then 200 are the invoice ID and the value. If I run that, it actually affected the row, but nothing came out. And the reason nothing came out is because we didn't run a statement, a select statement, to actually pull this out. And here, in memory already, is the at row count variable that's available to us. So if we take this now and just do, run this select statement, here we'll see that the row count is actually available to us. And it's there. What happens if we run this again? And let's run it again. I think it only is going to create a one row. Let's see what happens. And run that. It's one row. Because all we did was change for, for one row. And um, just to kind of prove something, I'm going to change this. No, nah, I'm not going to. Just, um, but this value here, one, is getting updated to update count. And update count is what is getting um sent back right here. This is the output variable, update count. And so by setting update count, the output variable to 1, that's what it's going to be. If I change that to another number and updated the, the procedure, it would in fact spit out whatever that number is. Okay, page 420 and 421 now introduce us to this idea of setting default variables. I'm going to modify the name of the um, update invoice credit total to three that they have actually given us. So when we execute this, set that to three. So again, we have a copy of it. And, we have and let's look at the code. We have two input variables here and uh, no returning variables. We're um, declaring SQL error for um, just in case an error happens. We're um, creating a continuing handler, exception handler, and we're setting SQL error to true. And here, notice we have two inputs, invoice ID and credit total. Here, if the credit total is null, then set credit total to 100. Say if somebody, when they called the routine, didn't have a, um, a, 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 an item in there. We, well, we're just going to give everybody a credit total of 100. But if they have are passing in a credit total, then we won't set this. Then we start the transaction, we update it, and we, we're checking for errors. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Highlight this, run it. Come over here, refresh our screen. I don't understand why this has done this to me a couple of times that it wasn't creating. I think what happens is, let me take this away, control X, and then this just run everything. There, now invoice all is here. So just run the whole thing straight through, and then add back the select statements at the end. So now, if I call invoice credit total three, it did the work, and if I select it and look at the data, it's set to 200 because that's what we passed in was 200. But now, if I call it without a parameter, making it null, 
and then I select it. Notice it's set to 100. Then if I call it with a value of 0, and then I take a look at the data, I see it's set to 0. 0 is not null. Null is nothing. 0 actually is a value um, in front when it comes to an integer. So there's a difference between passing in 0 and passing in null. But you can see that what we were doing is calling the same procedure several times, passing in a value, passing it in no value, and passing in even a zero, and we analyzed the data as we looked at it each each time, and saw the changes the procedure made. Okay, we're on pages 422 and 423. Um, I've not used this command um, before that they're teaching us, the signal, but what I can tell that it does is basically if a given situation is true within the then statement, we can signal a SQL state and create our, our own error. And we can actually set a message for that, that when the error is thrown, would actually be when that situation is true, we'd actually be able to see it. I'm going to change this to invoice total 4 highlight the whole thing and run the whole thing okay so now the procedure is created refresh we see that invoice update invoices credit total 4 is there and now what I'm going to do is delete all that and let's take a look at the sample calls that it's giving us to run and so if we run this we get um, column credit total cannot be null and um, if we go back and look at our code and the the message here is a 1080 now let's run this with the negative number we get one row affected and let's take a look at the data on that it's it's minus 100 and that's okay here we're going to call it with a thousand and let's take a look at that and it's set that and let's call it with zero and take a look at that it should set it back to zero now what I'm curious about is I was expecting a signal message uh, let's see, the credit column must be less than a thousand dollars and we actually didn't get that when we ran that here so let's um, let's call this with a thousand nine dollars I'm just gonna call this one here with a thousand nine dollars and what I'm not seeing is I'm not seeing that it's throwing that let's take a look at the book and chapter and see what it says Okay, so I don't know what I was doing wrong then, but I, I basically I re I re -ran, ran the procedure builder built it. Maybe I didn't have credit total four here when I issued it. That might have been my mistake, and that I was running that. So now here you can see that I have the value of a thousand nine in there, and when I execute this, you can see I have credit total must be less than a thousand dollars. The point is here, we saw that in SQL you can, there are errors that are thrown within the language, but here you're predefining an error condition based upon some logic within your own code. And what's happening is there's, there's system errors and, pro, and, and um, then there's application value errors where an application error is something that you really don't want the user to do or the system to do, but the code's not broken. It's just the state of the data is not what you want. So you then throw your own type of error. Okay, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. The next few things, dynamic SQL and a couple of other things, they're interesting. Spend a couple of minutes on it, but don't kill yourself with it. Um, again, it's getting a little more advanced than I want to go through in this class. 
Um, for those of you that are interested in it, dig into it a little bit and have fun with it. But I'm up at 434 and 435 figure 519. And this is where we're creating a function now. And here we're going to drop this function, get vendor ID if it exists. We're going to create the function. We're going to pass in a company name, vendor name, has a var car. And we're going to return the integer. And the integer we're returning actually is the vendor ID. So we know the company name, but we don't know the vendor ID for that. And then we're basically declaring a variable. We're doing a select statement where we want to get where the vendor name equals. We want to get the records from the vendor's file, the vendor ID, from where the vendor name equals what we put in. And then we do this return the uh, value of the ID. So let's go ahead and I'm going to delete this select statement here for a minute. Highlight all this and run it. Check our routine and we see now we have this little F parentheses get vendor ID. And here the book gives us this uh, select statement. I want to run another one first. I'm going to go select get vendor ID passing it in IBM from invoices. Now what we're doing here is the get vendor ID is actually passing in a vendor ID and it's selecting from the vendors table to actually get it which is kind of strange because I think vendor ID already does exist in the invoices table but it's trying to prove a point and then we have for every single invoice we have a 34 and it's listing all of the invoices at that point because we're doing a select and here we can do it um, this run this select statement and now what we're getting is the invoice numbers and um, for, for that vendor but the point is that you can do a select statement create a function and return something and that works out really nicely. I'm going to play and create a simple one and see what happens. Okay, I was digging myself into a little hole, so I changed my mind. Let's jump on to page 436 and 437. This is actually a really good example. And let's create this function called get balance due. We built the function, and the get balance due function basically we're going to pass in an invoice ID and we're going to calculate and figure out what the um, balance due for is select the invoice total minus the payment total minus the credit total into the balance due variable from the invoices file where the balance invoice ID equals the invoice ID parameter so for a given invoice we want to find out what it is so um, here I have my get balance due function I've refreshed my uh, object browser and now if I do this select statement get the vendor ID the invoice number and the balance due has balance due for number 37 I run this I see that uh, I gotta move that up a little bit I see that for all of number 37's balances I got two that are zero one that's got that Let's try vendor ID um, 54. Does that guy exist? There's no 54. Um, do we have a vendor ID 5? Nope. So let's um, select star from invoices. Um, okay, 122, 123. So let's like vendor ID 122. And we having the balance, balance dues from that. And 123. And we're having the balance dues 
for this guy and looks like he doesn't owe anything. Oh yes, he does. He actually has a couple of invoices that have some some that he owes. But the point here is what we've done is we've created a function that does some work and we're putting that function name into our select statement right here get balance due so that way we don't have to do all of that work over and over again we can just pass in some information and here we're passing in the invoice ID into the get balance due function and we get the result of the balance due the last thing um, on page 438 and 439 Basically, they teach us to drop a function, and we've done that a hundred times. Drop function and then the name. So um, that gets you through. There's some inter a couple more pages on using um, stored routines and creating storage routines with MySQL Workbench. Uh, it's kind of generic information, but it's uh, worth a couple of minutes read. Again, I'm not really worried about turning us into hardcore procedure developers and function developers. What I'm hoping we're doing is learning to different ways we can access data, update data, and um, start to get introduced to this. The goal is not to turn you into programmers. If anything, the things that we've learned here, we start to even understand better how to access the database. It's all good. Have a great day.